Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 3, Episode 2, titled Stone's War. It originally premiered on October 3rd, 1986. It was written and directed by David Jackson. He wrote another episode and directed another episode, but we will remember him fondly from the episode French Twist. Not fondly. <laughs> Not fun. So does Michael Mann just automatically get a executive producer credit for the rest of the series? Because I, I saw his so. name in the credits. Yeah, I believe he'll get executive producer because he created the show through the rest of it. But yeah, but he has anything to do with it. Yeah. yeah. Before we get started, yeah. I can check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. And Melissa, I know you won't hide for a second your love of Transformers. I love the Transformers. <laughs> You are you are the biggest Transformer fan I have ever met, and I had Generation One Transformer toys. <laughs> you know more canon than anyone else that I, I had know. Transformer underwear. <laughs> <laughs> well, that goes pretty deep, John. <laughs> I never had any Transformer Whitey underwear. Tidies. <laughs> if they made them for girls, I probably would have had them. <laughs> Here you go, oh, audience. I will prove to you the fan that Melissa is of Transformers. Who does the voice for Optimus Prime? Peter Wilson? Cullen. Wait, who does the voice for Megatron? I can't remember his name. <laughs> no, I know it's the same person, though. No, I can't remember his name. Well, you know that he does the voice for uh, Starscream. He also, mm-hmm. did, yeah, he also did Megatron. Also did Starscream's voice mm-hmm. and a bunch of other characters in there, which is also true with Peter Cullen. He's done several characters. Mm-hmm. Also, he was in. Peter Cullen was in a Donald Duck episode. He was when Donald Duck was in the military. He was that <laughs> boss. I know that much. So, Melissa, I wouldn't say that we've been huge fans of the new Transformers movies because, in your opinion, the best movie of the '80s was the Transformers movie. <laughs> but I, I can't talk about it. And what's the saddest movie you've ever seen? Transformers. <laughs> I mean, I don't uh, want to spoil it for anybody, but somebody big dies and it really crushed me. <laughs> We've been seeing it now that the new Transformers movie, the new one is out. We have been fans of the, of the new We ones. have seen them all. Mm-hmm. We have seen the newer ones, all of them, because we also have a son who that I somehow wrangled into being a Transformer <laughs> fan. And I mean, of course, there's the Michael Bay Miami Vice connection. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. There you go. I mean, I, you know, he's Miami Vice <laughs> alum. Come on now. So what have you heard about this new Transformers movie? I have not heard good things. Not favorable. Not favorable <laughs> at all. I've heard that it's not that great and that there's a lot of explosions. I've heard it's confusing. The only positive I've heard of it is that Peter Cullen is Peter Cullen and that Optimus Prime mm-hmm. still gives people chills and they still love Optimus Prime. And we're an 80s podcast. And so we, that's why we're talking about Transformers is because it's the movie about a TV show about toys from the 80s. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just... Have you heard anything about him moving like Liam Neeson? <laughs> no, I know. I'm trying to forget that that was ever brought up that Liam Neeson could ever be Optimus Prime. <laughs> Please report back when you do see it. I, I would love to know. No. Well, not all is bad news in the movie, so it's sad that Transformers movie isn't living up to, even though it looks like Dark Energy on. Oh, uh, yeah, in this movie. exactly. But not all was bad news, right, John? Yeah, I had the opportunity to watch Wonder Woman the other day, and it is fantastic. DC you liar. Finally got, you DC liar. DC finally got one right. Yeah. <laughs> with, no way. I refuse to believe that. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, with them managing to screw up even the coolest of DC comics, including the Batman vs. Superman, they had to get this one right, and thankfully they did. So Justice League is still on. There's still hope for it. <laughs> is there hope for Aquaman? Because I'm really into that. You know? <laughs> and I don't even care if I don't know Aquaman's past. I'm like, whoa, Jason Momoa, I'm listening. <laughs> well, speaking of Aquaman, we found out that oh there's someone God. big, someone really big for an 80s podcast. There's someone huge that's in the new Aquaman movie. Dolph Lundgren. If he really? dies, he dies. <laughs> <laughs> if he drowns, he drowns. <laughs> Yeah, he's another, he's like some underwater sea king in a different kingdom, which I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. I mer- assume there's dolphins. Tell me he's like a seven foot tall merman. <laughs> <laughs> Who can do like advanced physics and rocket science. Yeah. 
<laughs> all I, we saw like a video of him because obviously, I mean, you know me, I follow him on social media <laughs> with, uh, with Jean Claude Van Damme, mm-hmm. and um, he was like flying with like rat like things attached to him, like you know, mm-hmm. doing CGI flying. I'm like, oh my god, it's Dolph Lundgren. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go talk about this episode of Miami Vice. Now that we've covered so much different stuff from the eighties. <laughs> let's go talk about this episode of Miami Vice because it was a really good episode of Miami Vice. But there's some but it there but. <laughs> that we'll talk about at the end. So let's go talk about this episode. All right. So before we get started, we talk about the opening. So what I'm, we're going to mention in the in the beginning here, this is a straight up sequel to the episode Back in the World from season two. It's season two, episode 10. This is a as close to a sequel as it gets in Miami Vice. That's where we're going to open up here is we are going to see someone immediately from the episode Back in the World. We open up in a small South American country it's in the nicaraguan countryside it's a very small town and everything's going great there's like a parade <laughs> happening in the street well i was like that was like a funeral though yeah <laughs> just so you know <laughs> that, was a parade. that was like a body in a casket <laughs> it was a fantastic parade they were carrying boxes <laughs> yeah that and that's what it me i was thinking like miami's looking pretty run down these days they must be in like <laughs> south be beach like in the yeah the bad side of town <laughs> But everything's going fine. <laughs> the funeral is going off with that hitch. Everything's going good. There's like some happy music playing. And then all of a sudden the mortars start landing all over the city. And then this invading army comes and just starts massacring people all over the streets. Yeah. And this militia really has a dis- strong disliking of trucks. And not <laughs> like trucks. Up. <laughs> oh, yeah. No one can own the truck. <laughs> As the invasion happens, another force, the opposing force is starts fighting with them there's gun battles in the streets and we see run out of the building ira stone the reporter slash try and frame a criminal person <laughs> from back in the world he's a wheel and a dealer okay That's <laughs> sunny crockett's buddy from the vietnam, vietnam war and if you remember the episode from back in the world it's where they figure out that there's dro- heroin from from the vietnam era that is now being sold on the streets of miami and ira knows who it is ends up being someone named maynard who is the captain they refer to him as the captain who's selling it so ira's back and he's there with the cameraman but like a like a home movie camera and they're filming what's happening on the street they film a moment where one of the invading forces who is clearly american shoots and kills a priest and then turns and shoots and kills his cameraman. Ira looks at his camera, his dead cameraman, who's yelling out for help. Like, please help me. He grabs the camera and just runs away. Yeah, he's like, okay, bye. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't help you. <laughs> the priest and the cameraman were the only people who I actually saw get shot. Now, I know at the end they show all the them picking up the dead people. But uh, up until that point, it was like stormtroopers shooting out there. <laughs> There's a lot of terrible shooting in this episode, for the record. <laughs> and then after we see, we see this like with a picking up the bodies, as Sean mentioned, that we go to the opening credits. When we come back from the opening credits, we're at the airport and Ira has landed in Miami. He's whispering, like, please, Crockett, pick me up, pick me up. Where's Crockett? Where's Crockett? And they pan to the airport and you see Sonny. He's there. He's waiting on the other side of Customs for Ira to come through. Ira gets stopped by, by Customs just to give up his tapes all his re- recording tapes that he had uh while he filmed in Nick Nick Rogan. he puts up a little bit of a fight but they say we got to take him because there might be copyright infringing material or, or pornography or no <laughs> <laughs> so Crockett is there to pick Ira up and so they leave they walk out and they get in the truck and immediately Ira's like where's the Ferrari yeah what is this crap <laughs> But Crockett is not happy seeing Ira again. Which, who knows why he went to the airport to pick him up then? Yeah, I don't know why. Because <laughs> he's mad he at him, him the entire time. And when he, when he gets to the truck, he tells Crockett that he's got tapes, all these tapes of, oh, he's got one tape. He, got the he one pulled the tape. one tape out of these of the U.S. military fighting in Nicaragua, which would be a big deal because the U.S. military is not supposed to be there. Which, where did he store that tape? We all need to know. <laughs> Just saying, <laughs> How did where get was it? Customs with it. Is that tape really warm right now? <laughs> so Ira hops in the truck and they go to leave. And if you remember from Back in the World, Ira's played by Bob Balaban. Yeah, and so Bob Balaban of the Balaban producers and studio runners, we talked about him and G. Gordon Liddy at some length. But I, at this point, I want to point out our customs agent at this opening scene, played by Judy Wilson, who also played 
a humane officer in the episode One Eyed Jack, and a researcher in the episode Little Prince. Oh, so, yeah, so good old yeah. budget conscious I, vice. I remember her. She like gives him a big stack of papers, and she's like, "You have to go through these." Oh, the tax yeah, I stuff. remember now. And yeah. I also remember she's the one who tries to take Elvis away. Mm-hmm. She comes with another lady. Yep. And they're like, you can't have this, whatever alligator <laughs> talking about, whatever it is. And they yep. try and take him away. <laughs> this lady's always causing problems. Yep. Once your tapes, once Same. Elvis doesn't yeah. want to go through the paperwork. Exactly. Do your job. And she's not the only repeat offender in this episode. We have Dave Corey, who plays Bittenhouse in this episode, who is also going to be a reporter in the uh, upcoming episode of Bullet for Crockett, and a priest in another future episode called Victims of Circumstance. So he has a wide range. Yeah, he can play a priest, he can play a reporter. He's got, he's got a sweet and, headshot like the four different yeah. characters he can play. His range. Uh, and we're not even done. In the same episode, the person who plays O'Hara is also played the OCB clerk in episodes Cool Running, Calderon's Return Part 1, and Give a Little, Take a Little. So, wow. so he, we should he, know this person he, well. We don't know. <laughs> He got promotion. He was always the clerk in three different episodes, and then he got promoted to be O'Hara. So he must be pretty stoked. Yeah, I, it's it's amazing. The budget-conscious Miami Vice, I have a feeling that they have a closet there that's just full of people, and they just keep <laughs> them locked in there. <laughs> they probably just all work like as uh, they make food on the set or something, and they just, like pull them out. Hey, you know what? We got to do another episode. But I can't. I was a priest in the last episode. They'll never believe that I am a reporter now. Oh no, I'm sure it's something like Dick Wolf's mom's calling. Like you need the cousin Ray needs work. The cousin Ray needs work. Put him in yeah. an episode. <laughs> Guest stars aside. With Bob Balaban, and we have our routine background Miami Vice people here. Ira is going to head with Sonny over to Sonny's boat. And Stone is really nervous. He's obviously he's seen something that is illegal. So he's thinking that the government's after him. He's checking around in Sonny's boat for any bugs. He's telling Sonny that he needs professional protection. That's why he called him. That he needed someone to protect him because he thinks that the government's out to kill him. He, he gives Sonny the tape to watch in the camera. And Sonny sees... The shooting, he sees the military person shoot the priest, but he's still like, I don't Total believe you. What news. scam are, are, are you trying to pull? Total fake, it fake news. Yeah, it's fake news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah and, you can totally tell watching the tape. <laughs> <laughs> Ira eventually comes clean. He says that his rep in New York and, and anything in New York doesn't want anything to do with him. So the reason why he's in Miami is because he's trying to get a local affiliate who doesn't know who he is, basically, and is desperate for content to run this tape. But couldn't he go anywhere in the country then? Why do you have to go to just because he went to Miami just because of Sonny? Then? Just just because of Sonny. Even though yeah. Sonny hates him and he burned Sonny last time, like basically. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, I don't and, know. And All I know is my favorite part of the episode. Is, I mean, my, of the scene here is when he turns to Sonny and he's basically like, "Can I buy some weed from you?" <laughs> yeah. He's like, "Do you have any weed that you didn't put in lockup or whatever, or like turn in?" And, and Sonny's like, "What?" <laughs> What the hell is wrong with you? Well, Sonny says he can only stay for one day. The next day, so- Sonny gets up. He's going to work. He says, Ira, basically, he says, Ira, you, you got to get out of here. But Ira's making phone calls. He's doing his work. And then he's supposed to leave. Sonny also tells us, you need to take care of Elvis while you're feed here, him. He's too. like, what does he eat? Meat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sonny's got a busy day of car shopping at the police impound. <laughs> And that's exactly what happens here is at the at the precinct. Sonny shows up to work. He's talking to Tubbs a little bit about Ira being back and Castillo walks in. And as soon as Sonny sees Castillo, he goes running over there. He's like, I know this is a long process. We got to do our due diligence. It's been a month. But it's been a month and I'm getting tired of waiting. I can't be seen driving this truck, which is actually a really nice truck. Yeah, I know. (laughs) And then I asked Dominic, like, okay, so wait a minute. Why does he need such a nice, so much nicer car than Tubbs? Tubbs is going around in that convertible this whole time. Like, okay, I don't get this. <laughs> Castillo says, Hey, get off my back. It's out back. Yeah. And then we walk out to the back of the precinct. And this is when we see the car that people think of when they think of Miami Vice. It's the white Testarossa that actually is for sale right now. So if you're interested in buying it, it's only about $350,000, I think was the but last wait a minute. that I saw. Don Johnson sat in it. Yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> he sat in that thing. So he got quite the Ferrari eBay? upgrade. I'm going to bid. <laughs> John's going to bid on it. <laughs> so now it's here, except for in, 
in episode six where it goes back to the old Ferrari because the episodes are out of order. We don't need to talk about that. <laughs> Why you got to bring up bad things? But the car that everyone remembers from Miami Vice, this Ferrari Testarossa, and it's nice. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, it's nice. I don't even know how they swing this deal. Like, like how they got that car. <laughs> you know what that means? New driving scenes. We yeah. don't have to see the repeated old ones. <laughs> <laughs> What's amazing to me is that he still got another one after his last one being shot with a rocket launcher. Hey, for the record, he didn't shoot it. Yeah, but he, it's, he, the car's worth two hundred four hundred thousand dollars. It was in the line of duty. What's he supposed to say? Hey, I'm a cop. Don't shoot my <laughs> car that they get loaned to me. That's not really even my car. <laughs> Back at Sonny's boat, Ira still can't get a hold of anyone. No one really wants to take his story. But he finally gets a call from a studio. And they want to pay him $25,000. Which isn't really that much money, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) I was playing a little hardball. He says he's not really interested in selling it to a local station, which is exactly why he's in Miami. That's why he wants to do that. But we see in the filming, it's suspicious because everyone's in the suits. And then the TVs in the background have the American flags on them like. We know this isn't the actual studio that's calling here. This is a setup. Well, to try and get, I think get you should tape. mention also that in the airport scene, there are two men waiting for him in suits. Mm-hmm. They don't actually like show them go after him or anything, but they're watching him. So, yeah. And these are the same men that are making the, the offer in suits behind <laughs> with a TV in the back with American flags. It's very <laughs> suspicious. <laughs> Iris says he'll go see him in an hour. And that's exactly where we head next. We head over to the TV station where Ira has gone there. And he's just chatting up to the woman behind the counter. And she's totally ignoring him. As she's usual. like taking phone calls like while he's talking to her. every other woman in this episode, <laughs> everyone's trying to ignore him. <laughs> <laughs> And then he sees in the security, like not the cameras, like the TV behind the counter. Which is convenient that you can see down the hall what's going on. (laughs) He sees a man walking down the hall and he doesn't see him like pull a gun or anything. He sees a man in a suit, but he recognizes him because he's the man that shot and killed the priest in Nicaragua that he yep. has his tapes of. Minus a beard. Thank, yes. God she, thank God she wasn't watching the American flag channel. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Ira takes off running. The man chases him. They run around the building one time, and then Ira jumps on the back of a van. The van drives away, and that's how he escapes. Well, good thing they were only going to run that one time around the building. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, this episode would be a lot shorter. That night on Sonny's boat, Sonny comes back and he's surprised that Ira's still there. Sorry, it's not nighttime. It's like late afternoon. Late afternoon. Ira's trying to drink. He's hiding. Yeah, he's like hiding when Sonny comes back. He's like hiding in the boat. Yeah, and Sonny's pissed that Ira's back. He's like, I thought I told you to get out of here. I don't want none of your business. I don't want to be involved in anything that you're doing. You're leaving tomorrow. You are gone. Later, at the precinct, the duo comes in, and Trudy's reading off the wire now. That And this is like, things are moving along really fast here in the episode. Like It's like, all of a sudden, it's the next morning. They're showing up to work. Trudy's reading off the wire that Ira is a suspect in the cameraman's death. And also, there's a warrant, a federal warrant out for him, because him and the cameraman were involved in smuggling heroin from Nicaragua to the U.S. So I actually think this is the same day because then it's the next scene is at night at Sonny's boat. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Sonny was like stopping by for lunch or something on the Yeah, he might have been just checking on him because I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what the deal is. Had to change his shoes. (laughs) (laughs) He had to go pet his crocodile or alligator or whatever he is. Yeah. Crocky gets back to the boat and He catches one of the two goons from the airport snooping around the boat. And he, you know, puts his gun to him, starts talking all big, and then just gets whacked in the back of the head (laughs) because he's a terrible cop. (laughs) Yeah, he gets knocked out. I think it's the next morning he's woken up by the phone ringing. So the two goons obviously get away. They don't do anything to Sonny. They were just checking for Ira. They well, couldn't find not him that we saw. <laughs> what if they took advantage of him when he was passed out? Yeah, no, it's still like he just wakes up not the next morning. He just wakes up like a couple hours yeah, later. A couple hours later. It's so not at night, the for the record. Day. It's still on the same day. Mm-hmm. When he comes on the boat, it's not dark. It's it's like dusk dark. Yeah, it is. Because then, because the next scene. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, because the next scene that he goes to. He wakes up. He's bloodied. Mm-hmm. The phone's ringing. It's Ira. Ira saying he's at the airport. He's been followed yes, by a couple right. of new goons. Yeah. <laughs> and he's stalling at the airport. He wants Sonny to come get him. Sonny's obviously starting to believe in his story now. Well, yeah, because he's got a bloody head. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> so Sonny wakes up right next to Elvis. Like Elvis is like right next to his head. I thought is is 
Why does not Elvis ever eat Crockett? <laughs> I know. And then I said it before <laughs> before Sonny even said it. I'm like, what kind of watch animal is he, Elvis? You just like watched him get beat up and never even like tried to eat the people? Like, does he ever get the urge to just take a bite out of somebody? He doesn't ever attack anyone. The only thing he ever did was he got loose in the first season. Dur- he, yeah, he ate somebody's. And something. he like uh, mess. He like everyone on their boats like threw stuff at him to make him go away. So I think I think they are weekend at burning Elvis. Yeah, I know. Remember, I asked him like, "Is he dead? Because he's not moving at all." Like, when they show him in the screen, I'm like, "Is he really dead or something?" Or are they just like maybe they said, "Okay, now I don't want to think about it now. I can't think about it now." <laughs> the animal person in me like, "Oh my god, they did something to this poor." animals and make them all sit right. there like that <gasps> oh my god let, let, all right let, let's go back to crockett so crockett's gonna meet ira at the airport by the churro stand <laughs> he's gonna um, flash his lights three times it is the yes. fence ira hasn't seen the new testarossa yeah so he wouldn't know he wouldn't know this coming so but sonny's gonna go pick him up he's very mad at elvis by the way yeah he tells him like what kind of watch <laughs> so ira, uh, ira is standing at the desk of one of the airlines and he makes this uh, lady, because he, he, he feels safe there, I guess. He makes yeah. her jump through all these hoops to try and get him a ticket for going around the world. And the only thing tickets. I'm thinking in my head is like, United United wouldn't put up with this shit. Like they, <laughs> yeah, and, they'd be yeah. dragging his ass out of the airport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she automatically, though, he's like, um, she's like, he goes, can I wait here? She goes, no, get out of here. And he's like, fine, then I want to get tickets to go around the world. I want as many stops as possible. And mm-hmm. she's like, fine, whatever. Like, she's so, like, I'm like, well, this lady doesn't want to make any money for this airline, clearly. She doesn't know he's not going to buy the tickets. Mm-hmm. Customer service, I swear. Well, that's when Sonny comes driving uh, up. He flashes his lights. Well, then when she does do it all, he yells, I, I forgot my credit card runs away. So, I mean. That's what she gets for being a rude lady. <laughs> He did stiffer, so. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is when Sunny comes pulling up. He flashes his lights. Ira runs out and jumps into the Testarossa. And then the goons take in part in the chase. They ch- jump in their car. We have a montage. We have a chase montage. But this time it's reverse. It, 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 Sunny is on the run. It, it's a kooky car chase. And the music <laughs> does it no justice. The zany. The zany <laughs> car chase. And this is when they're shooting at him. And they cannot get a shot. Like th- those people that are chasing him, they're supposed to be like government, military people, or whatever. Mm-hmm. They cannot shoot that car for crap. I swear. <laughs> <laughs> uh. As they're driving through the city of Miami, and we get our first chase scene with Testarossa, he's flying around all over the city. He goes underneath a trailer from a from a big rig, and the car that's chasing them can't stop in time, and they smash and go all the way underneath the trailer. And I'm thinking like. Sonny just killed two people? I think he murdered them. Yeah. <laughs> they're dead. <laughs> <laughs> but they get out of the car and they're okay. But like, he's, this isn't as Sonny Crockett, the police officer. This is Sonny Crockett, friends of Ira, that he's doing this for. Now yeah, this, this is, is a- going to be a, cr- a criminal investigation. Yeah, up to this, it hasn't, nothing, nothing has been Miami Vice stuff. This mm-hmm. isn't really... This yeah. is really just a, a a Crockett episode, not a police episode. Just mm-hmm. a Crockett episode. Because yeah, yeah. No, none of the other gang is really involved up to this point. Well, then Switek has to go and get involved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, well, well, we're getting to that because obviously, Vice's safe houses aren't safe. And Crockett knows <laughs> nope. this. Nope. So he was in a safe house. Jail. Ira, <laughs> yes, he takes Ira to jail, which isn't safe. He's safe. But I guess it's the only safe safest place. option yeah. that they have. <laughs> so, and so remember, folks, the safest place in Miami is jail. <laughs> I think that applies to Florida in general. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, Sonny is believing Ira now. He knows that there's something seriously wrong here. It's good. Now there's reason for investigation. They've assaulted a Miami police officer. They fired a weapon in the streets of Miami. There's there's cause for investigation and believe something, some stuff that Ira has said. So the next day, Sonny goes as Sonny Burnett to go deliver. But this is still a Sonny the friend here. There's, there can be an investigation, but Sonny's still helping out Ira. He goes and gives a woman... Her name is Alicia. She works for a different TV uh, news station in Miami. He gives her the tape, and he's there as Sonny Burnett. She doesn't like Sonny at all, which is funny to me. Yeah, she's... like she's like he's sleazy. She, lady, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> he's wearing his nice suit. How can he be sleazy? <laughs> she likes tubs. That's her problem. So, 
I'm going to point out that the reporter is played by Lynette McKee, who was a child prodigy and pop star with middling success and, and actor. She actually wrote the title song for the movie Quadroon at 15. So and then a few years later, she performed in a hit musical drama called Sparkle with Philip Michael Thomas. Shut up. I think, yes. Shut up. I think hit should be like, <laughs> I don't know about that hit. And part. it was a musical. It was a hit musical. That means I Philip Michael have Thomas much singing it. <laughs> didn't have much success and it was not widely received. No. <laughs> hey, it got her a job on Vice. It did. L- Lynette McKee also released three solo albums in the 80s. She was. She's also done a few films. The two ones that jumped out to me was she was in He Got Game. And she was also in Brewster's Millions. She played Angela Drake. Oh, no my way. gosh. Oh. Wow. <laughs> yeah. See, I knew that was going to be the one you guys would recognize. Because it's like, well, Brewster's Millions. Yeah. Like, as soon as I saw the character name, I was like, she's the main girl in that movie. Like, that's actually a big role. And then for you and me, Melissa, she was also Maggie Davis on Third Watch. Oh, my gosh. I love Third Watch. <laughs> Why did I cancel that show? I know. And so abruptly, too. That's one of those shows where it was like one. They were like in the middle of a plot line. And it was like. Nope. To be continued. Canceled. Yep. Like, wait, wait a minute. No, I need to know. Speaking of guest stars, we have our next one here. So a real fast meeting here in the off in an office. There's a big table of executives. They're all TV executives. They're all speaking to a judge. And the man walking around introducing all of them to the judge is Maynard, also played by G. Gordon Liddy. So this is that's all that happens in this scene. But Maynard's back after escaping from Miami Vice. He's just back in the U.S. just hanging out, making huge deals with media companies and carrying around a rope yeah, of dude. ears. <laughs> what the yeah, hell? He collects ears. Yeah, yeah, a hell? necklace made of ears. <laughs> just to be clear here, I know we're not going to talk about too much about this scene, but what's happening here is that Maynard is selling to these TV executives. That he will cause civil war in Nicaragua, even though they're not they're fighting against US US militia, but he's the news they can film it and make it look like there's a drug war happening in Nicaragua. And so the news companies are making money off of this. That's why they partnered with Maynard. So he is even slimier than he was before. Yeah. No, he, yeah. I mean he got I, we just said he's got a necklace full of ears. How much more <laughs> slime are you gonna get? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, ears, people. So while he's showing off his ear necklace, Crockett goes back to the precinct, doesn't say hello to Trudy, even though she said hello first. <laughs> um, John's all bitter. And then he gets all upset at Zwitek because Zwitek's like, hey, man, do your own work. <laughs> uh, someone no, picked up your boy. can't handle doing anything correctly. <laughs> Yes, so to set the record straight here, Switech let someone with no ID and no badge number and a fake federal warrant take Ira out of jail and then and then didn't follow up, make sure he took him to a different federal jail in, in custody. He's just been kidnapped now. Yeah, and Tubbs told him he was supposed to sit on him and they were supposed to keep him there no matter yeah. what. And then yeah. Switech's like, whatever. And then, I, 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 he was he had a badge. Like, yeah. and then Switech calls, and there's no such person named Detective O'Hara with the uh, with the FBI. And then he See, doesn't that, make that eye contact with because he's really, that, that's because he's secretly an OCB clerk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why he doesn't have his name in the. So once again, Switech screws up. He screwed up bad, and, and Zito wasn't there to pick up the pieces. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because Zito, remember, he's the brains behind that operation. <laughs> Which is sad, but yes. <laughs> also, I take notes is where all the good taco stands are. <laughs> Hamburger places, you know, those two. <laughs> and he was like making a phone call when Crockett came up. He was probably ordering pizza. Probably, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I also want to say... That when we come in, so after he's done talking to Zwitek, Sonny goes back over to his desk. He gets a phone call. It's clearly Maynard. He just says that he recognizes the voice. I just want to point out really fast here. Tubbs, he stepped his game up in this season. He's looking fantastic. Yeah, I know. His outfits are just like on point. With those suspenders. I know. And the glasses. 
he really looks good with the glasses. Like, yeah. makes him look so much more studious. <laughs> <laughs> Don Johnson's got to start to reevaluate his wardrobe here because uh-uh. Tubbs is showing him up. Uh uh-uh. uh. No. <laughs> Don Johnson looks hot. Everything he does is hot. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, they go in the next scene, Crockett goes back to that reporter and she's kind of like, uh, your story's meh. Uh, no one cares about dead people, poor people. You know. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, he throws a tizzy. Here. He throws a tizzy fit and leaves. And then Tubbs smooth talks her, and she gives him a copy of the tape. Oh yeah, he laid it on thick. <laughs> thick. Hold the jacket I'm back. Just and you see those rainbow suspenders. He put his glasses <laughs> on. And he just looked at her. <laughs> she's like, he's not. He goes, oh, he's a little bit uh, excited, overexcited. She's like, he's just rude. Uh, you just said you didn't care that his friend was going to die. So, yeah, I think you might be a little rude, lady. Uh, this also isn't the only time Tubbs throws the game in this episode. He like mm-hmm. He's on the phone yeah, with someone like, oh, else. Yeah. Baby, I'll take you like, out. <laughs> you give yourself a kiss for me. Yeah, what the? <laughs> yes. All right, Tubbs, you're getting a little creepy now. <laughs> Gotta say, that'd be a little creepy on my end if I heard that on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> come on don't you remember we were in sparkle together <laughs> yeah exactly so they leave from the news station they have a copy of the tape we have a fast scene at the house where they're keeping ira and where they're like torturing him by forcing him to eat shrimp chinese food yeah, <laughs> yeah. that guy's cool uh, unless he's allergic to shrimp this is more sexual than intimidating <laughs> I don't know what's happening, but I do see. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> I do see, though, that Maynard has dimed out Alicia, the person that he gave the tape to. Like, I'll talk to her and tell her that it's that it's all fake. Bro, why are you giving yeah, out like who you gave it to? She, they're going to they're gonna kill you. What's going to stop them from killing her? I know. Like, why did you tell? Do Shira. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So now this we go to all the... This going to lead back to Nixon somehow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so now we go to the Maynard meet. This is where Sonny's going to go pass off that copy of the tape to Maynard. They're going to release Ira. It's in a parking garage, of course. Ira tied up in a van. Tubbs, uh, Crockett gives the tape to Maynard. He runs it through a machine. He's like, yeah, it's fake. He's like wearing a, <laughs> what the hell he's wearing? Like a strap. And it's, it looks like it would be like one of those old VCRs you used to rent when you were a kid. Because mm-hmm. you, you were too poor to have a VCR. <laughs> well, that's just my family. <laughs> Got a Peter Max with him. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. He puts it in, punches it in like, uh, yeah, what did you think? I was stupid. I was going to fall for this fake. And Sonny's like, eh, we Rich. gave it a shot. <laughs> Come on, Sonny. You know you <laughs> no. make so a copy. Must ask this the fabulous back. would be that stupid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I love how Sonny doesn't even act surprised. He's like, eh, we give it a shot. We tried. We tried. Back at the news station, Alicia's working late. And this is when one of the goons shows up. He sneaks in, hits her in a, with a magnet. Hits her, with a she, phone first. It's a magnet. Oh, no, I thought so, it was like a cord, I had a cord to catch. Yeah, first. it's a magnet. So oh, okay. what he's there to do is to destroy the tapes in its VHS days. So you could use, it's a magnetic tape. Yeah, so if you, you put a magnet, magnet over it. You can ruin the tapes. That's what he does. He ruins all the tapes. And then when she tries to escape, he hits her with the magnet, knocks her to the ground, and then uses the magnet to kill her at the end of the yeah, scene. Yeah, I don't understand too. why he didn't, why he couldn't just leave her knocked out. I guess she wasn't going to say anything. I don't know. Whatever. I don't know. I, and I was curious because like at the end of the scene, he like he holds the magnet over over it. And I mean, until you see the next scene where you see like the body outline on the floor, I thought, is he going to try and erase her mind with the magnet? <laughs> is this guy an idiot? Smart. <laughs> And like, could it be like she had screws in her head? And that's how he killed her. He like sucked them out of the out of her skull. I don't know, but yeah, I, I don't know. I was just surprised he didn't try and feed her shrimp. <laughs> he got shrimp in his pocket. During the investigation the next day with the duo there, Sunny. It's another co- confusing part. Sunny's digging through her desk and finds a paper that shows that the priest that was killed. She finally ran down who the priest was that got shot and killed. It's an American from Dayton, Ohio. And so that causes Sonny to then pick up the phone and call and ask Switek for the judge's name that issued the warrant. I don't understand Which, that why either. Why did he do that in the beginning? I don't get it either. But can we also yeah. talk about that they were not that upset about her being dead? No, they, they really were like, eh, dead. whatever. <laughs> like even Tubbs, who flirted with her to get the tapes, like she's dead because of you people. <laughs> and you don't even care. Like, <laughs> well, she should have gave us the tape when we wanted it originally. And she wouldn't be dead. I, I just thought... <laughs> I just love how Crockett's, oh, it was sloppy. You know, they definitely didn't plan on killing her. And I'm like, actually, 
Yeah. It kind of looks like they, 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 they plan on killing her. I told Dominic, I go, how did they not plan on it? And that's the first thing he did was knock her out. He could have just got the tape from her. Yeah. She probably would have just given it up because she would have been so afraid. Mm-hmm. But no, he planned on killing her. He erased her mind. <laughs> Yeah. So then they head over to go see Zarvo, this judge that issued the warrant. They corner him in an elevator and they they tell him they're going to charge him for they're going to be on him and maybe even charge him for murder because of if they don't help them find Ira, they'll, they're going to kill him. And so then he caves and gives them the phone number that he got the calls from because they didn't they didn't meet in a single location. They didn't know where Maynard was, but they just had a phone number. So then the duo head back to the precinct to run a trace on the number, find the house, and this is where we go over to the house where they were keeping Ira. Of course, that guys never locked the door. I know. <laughs> never locked the door. And of course, the duo go with no backup. You would think that this would be the time they would tell Dad that we're going to go make a bust on some militia that might be a p- part of a government conspiracy. And he's like, okay, guys, have fun. <laughs> yeah, whatever. No, I don't think Casio knows yeah. anything that's going on. He's in his office. Which means that this is never <laughs> vice. And at the house, they kind of sneak around. They see some blood on the floor. And then Tubbs, the real police officer, goes inside. <laughs> he finds in the trash can the for some reason, they had printed orders for their militia where they were supposed to meet. <laughs> I don't know what that, that was. They just crumbled up and threw in the trash can. All right. So he can dig through the trash. And now that makes him super cop. <laughs> Uh, Let's not get crazy now, okay? <laughs> he don't got the he don't have the fancy car. That's why he's stuck <laughs> with that old convertible, living in his uh, car. <laughs> and now this is where we go, where it's essentially the last scene of the episode. There's one little one at the end, but this is essentially the end. This is where we head out to an airport, kind of way out off the beaten path, maybe even out into the glades. It's in, it a is. It's bit. in the Everglades. It's, yeah, he says. As as yeah. Tub shows him the the papers, he goes, "Oh, it's in the gla- it's in the Everglades." Okay, and they go, "Okay, yeah, yeah." It's it's like a private airfield that takes. Did, did, did they murder an entire town nearby there? <laughs> That's why there's no one to stop the planes. Or anything. <laughs> this weird ghost town. We're just gonna meet there. <laughs> I think it just proves nothing good happens in the Everglades. I think we should all just admit that. We're rough on Florida this episode, but it's true. <laughs> they see the militia load up their airplane. T- Tubbs Crockett is just watching from afar through the binoculars. Well, not that far, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. They're, they're still close enough. They can see without the binoculars, <laughs> yeah. too. But I don't know. One of the buildings on the ground, you hear Ira being tortured by someone who still think that he's got a copy of the tape somewhere. Because in the Back in the World episode... He did have a copy, a backup copy of yeah. his manuscript in that episode. So they feel like he's still hiding one out. He says he doesn't have anything, torturing him in the house. Outside, the duo moves in on Maynard and then force him to take them over to where Ira is. He turns on his radio so that his team can hear the conversation he's having with Tubbs and Crockett. So this is where we get to this the final moments here in this episode. They pull up to the house where Ira's being tortured. They take Maynard at gunpoint into the house. And they get the other goon to put his gun down. They have everyone at gunpoint. Ira's still alive. He's badly hurt, but he's still alive. For the record, Ira can take a bullet, man. He's he took, taking a lot of he bullets. He took like seven. I think, yeah. Sure. yeah. Not including in Back in the World where he got shot up in that episode. Yeah, too. that's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> this is when one of the other militiamen busts in another door and there's a shootout. So what happens here is that the goon shoots and they kills miss everybody. <laughs> Everyone's a terrible shot in this episode. <laughs> yes, yes. Crockett and Tub should be dead along with Ira. <laughs> well, the goon shoots and kills Ira. Tubbs kills the man that had busted in. Sonny kills the goon. And by the way, Sonny got shot too. Oh, he did? He got shot in I the arm. That. In like the oh. hand. Yeah, he got shot <laughs> yeah, in the that wrist. Yeah, that's like grazed his wrist. <laughs> he took a bullet. Have you ever it, taken a bullet in the wrist? I don't it think didn't so. even affect his shooting. It, he still <laughs> shot the guy. <laughs> Just saying, I don't remember you ever taking a bullet anywhere. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he even drove him back. Like, <laughs> yeah, probably. Of course, Maynard escapes. He drives off in the Jeep. He pulls up to the airplane. He gets in. He gets in the airplane in the most smuggest way possible. <laughs> he gets in in the doorway to the airplane, looks around like, yep, going bye bye. He's yeah. out, like bitches. a Richard Nixon. Yep. <laughs> like where he got up to the top yep. of the stairs and does the. Yeah. Uh-huh. And he gets back in the plane and that's it. <laughs> yep. Plane takes off. Yeah. And there goes the Maynard again. And they try to catch up with him. They get in the Jeep. And that's where you see that Sonny's been shot after 
you realize, every, you know, obviously Ira's been shot and dead. So, yeah, mm-hmm. again, once so again, they, Maynard has escaped. And just doing the math here, we have a dead reporter, a dead whistleblower, and two dead militia officers, and no explanation of the, after, the aftermath. <laughs> Maynard flies away. No one explains where the dead bodies have. Apparently, the reporter's case is probably still open. Probably some cold case detective somewhere two years later trying to figure out who murdered her. <laughs> oh, my God. This ties back to the Nixon campaign. <laughs> <laughs> Is this what Watergate was? <laughs> we do have one last scene before the episode is officially over. We see Sonny he's sitting on his boat. He's doing a little fishing. And he hears on the news that the news is saying that the Nicaraguan troops killed that priest. And American troops were there to try and rescue him before the Nicaraguans killed him. So it's working out in Maynard's favor all around. So because- in other words, they're never going it, to... Never- the truth will never come out. Yep. It's, it's open and shut. There'll never be yep. a, another story and about this it. This is where I wanted to say this episode was all for nothing because it didn't involve Miami Vice. It was a Sonny Crockett personal story. I'm not saying it's a bad episode. Just saying that this had nothing to do with Miami yeah. Vice. So it was all a Sonny personal story. No repercussions for the people involved except for the random dead people that got caught in the, in the crossfire. Yep. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Well, I, I, have more th- I have more thoughts on that that I'll save for my final thoughts. And then I'm going to argue with you about them. <laughs> <laughs> but first, let's go talk about the music. Because we actually have a couple repeat people, believe it or not, in the Dick Wolf era. We have some repeat music. All right, John. We have some Peter Gabriel. We have someone from Duran Duran. But then we have a couple of new people like Jackson Brown. What do you got for us in music this week? All right. So I'm going to start with Mercy by Steve Jones, English guitar singer and actor, best known for being the guitarist of the Sex uh, Sex Pistols. Uh, essentially, he co-founded the band The Strand with Paul Cook and Wally Nightingale in the early 70s. They were the precursor to that eventually became the Sex Pistols, with Wally being replaced by Glenn Matlock and this, John uh, Lydon. This is a direction I didn't expect this to go. I think so. I was first I'm like, okay, this this is going to be some deep cut from the 80s. Then you're like, he was formed in the Sex Pistols. Like, what? Huh? Yeah, I know. What? During his time in the Sex Pistols, this is just kind of a funny bit of information that I got to chuckle out of. Uh, and it might tie in a little in, in a minute. The Sex Pistols once stole equipment pose, while posing as road crew members from a truck parked behind the David Bowie show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Yes. The in- interesting fact is that Steve Jones also played the bass in the studio for the Six Pestles because apparently Sid Vicious was just terrible. Um, <laughs> just terrible. So he played the bass part and then Sid would pr- play it on stage. The Sex Pistols would end up breaking up in 1978. Um, he would join a short-lived band called The Professionals with Paul Cook. He would Basically, play guitar on tracks for a bunch of different people. He would play with bands like Thin Lizzy. He did some work with Billy Idol, Iggy Pop, Joan Jett, Bob Dylan, and even our next, the next person in our music, Andy Taylor. Just a few more things. In 95, Steve Jones played guitar on a self-titled and only album ever released by the band called P. That's the letter P. <laughs> that band that band featured Gibby Haynes of the Butthill Surfers and Johnny Frickin' Depp. Oh. oh yeah, because he's a guitarist, so or was he the lead singer? <laughs> I, I don't know. He plays I don't the guitar. Know. I think yeah. yeah, Johnny Depp I think was the lead singer and Steve Jones was the guitarist and Haynes from the Butthole Surfers was the drummer. All I know is they only made one album and then the band went bye bye. Well, I guess Johnny Depp so, had better things to do than <laughs> Or they were just terrible. No. Terrible. No, Johnny Depp's not terrible uh, at anything uh, it, he does. <laughs> in 96, Steve Jones formed the Neurotic Outsiders, which featured Guns N' Roses members Duff McKagan and Matt Sorum. Duff McKagan actually has been in a bunch of different bands. In fact, he's currently in The Walking Papers, which is an excellent band. Also in The Neurotic Outsiders was John Taylor, the other half of Duran Duran. So not only did he work with Andy Taylor, he worked with John Taylor. Also in 96, Steve Jones provided uh, guitar checks for Insane Clown Posse's The Great Maleko, Malenko. 
album. Since the 2000s, he reunited with the Sex Pistols. He plays soccer in the Hollywood FC, which is a team made up of celebrities and has-beens. He is the head of the house band for the Russell Brand FX show, Brand X, which, was started, uh, which started in 2013. I'm pretty sure it's canceled by now, or at least I hope so. <laughs> so our next song is When the... Rain Comes Down by Andy Taylor. Andy Taylor being one of the former members of Duran Duran and the super band Power Station. Which um, we've had a song from Duran Duran before, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So we've already done this Duran Duran breakup. This I'm going to just cover a few, little bit more about Andy Taylor, and specifically outside of the Duran Duran connection. So at 16 years old... He received uh, guitar lessons from Dave Black, who was a member of David Bowie's backing band, The Spiders from Mars. And David Black, who one time had his equipment stolen out of a truck parked behind one of (laughs) David Bowie's shows. But I don't know who did that. Um, Very strange. Taylor, you know, he began his tenure with Duran Duran. They played the Birmingham Club, which is like a disco club. A Birmingham club called Rum Runner, which was like a disco club. And that's where they tested their acts and wrote most of their first hits. They hit the pinnacle of success around 1983. And then in 85, while they were taking a hiatus, Andy and John Taylor... Along with Chick member Tony Thompson and Robert Palmer for Power Station, the supergroup, and, and their first album reached the top 10 in the US and featured hits like Some Like It Hot and the T Rex cover of Get It On Bang a Gong. So ultimately, the success outside of Duran Duran would eventually lead to the breakup of Duran Duran. After six years together, they were spread across, the members were spread across three different continents. They barely spoke to each other, and Andy was now living in L.A. and would meet Steve Jones. Wait a minute, I know that name. (laughs) Steve Jones would collaborate on Taylor's first solo album, uh, would also, uh, during that time, he'd also released the single Take It Easy, which was used on the theme to the movie American Anthem. So he released his first solo album in 1987 entitled Thunder, co-wrote and co-produced in 87 and 88 Rod Stewart's multi-platinum album Out of Order. In the 90s, he mostly worked as a producer, producing several UK bands. He also recorded the last records uh, that Power Station would record, and another Rod Stewart record, A Spanner in the Works. I say the last Power Station records because one of the members of the band Chick, Bernard Edwards, who had also joined Power Station, actually died on tour of pneumonia in Tokyo. And that would kind of fizzle out the end of our station. And actually, it's a pretty crazy story, too, because he had pneumonia and they wouldn't wouldn't cancel the show. So he played, barely got through the show. And he was like, I'm going to go lay down and then just, just died. Wow. So since the 2000s, Andy Taylor has reunited with Duran Duran. They released their first new music since 1985, but because of issues with John Taylor just not showing up for stuff and a couple rehab stints, they really haven't done more than what than just released that music and tour a little bit. That brings us to Peter Gabriel, who we've already talked about. Who yeah. we will continue to talk about. We've talked about him a bunch. He still has a couple more songs that will come in. So <clears> no <throat> no one who knows Miami Vice is a stranger to Peter Gabriel. Peter Gabriel is apparently going to be the new Phil Collins. It's going to show up in my music <laughs> all the damn times. Yes, he is. Yeah, he does. He's got five more songs in four who, more future episodes. Who was also in Genesis with Phil Collins. Yep. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> just won't go away red rain is the song it's the first track on his 86 solo album so the album reached number three on main rocks on billboard's mainstream rock charts the song features stuart copeland the drummer from the police who did a guest appearance on the track basically he played the hi-hat in the background to make like rain noises but that was it (laughs) notice i am specifically just talking about the song because we'll have plenty of time to talk about peter gabriel later (laughs) And you've already talked. We've already had him in an episode before, too. Yes. So uh, <laughs> the song's lyrics. So hold on. I- I'm going to read you uh, two things about the song, and then we'll move on. Our author 
Daryl Islia wrote that this song was a brooding opening to the album, reflecting on two very current 80s obsessions, AIDS and nuclear fallout. <laughs> so think about that. <laughs> think just, about that. But you never thought well, of them I, combined together. Yes, yes. Think what about that thought bomb. as I, I read to you this next statement. The lyrics refer to a reoccurring dream where Peter Gabriel had a, a reoccurring dream Peter Gabriel had where bottles in the shape of people were falling over a cliff and upon hitting the ground and breaking released a red liquid and then that same red liquid began to rain. Okay. I don't fail to see how this that re- that equals HIV nuclear bombs. Yeah, what? <laughs> Yes, yes. I, I, don't, I don't understand. <laughs> so there's that. So that's a thing. <laughs> by the way, Peter Gabriel's weird. That's a weird ass dream. You need help, brother. <laughs> Our last song in the episode, "Lives in the Balance" by Jackson Brown. It actually is specifically refers to the political unrest in Central America and Guatemala at the, at the time. So it actually is very appropriate for the episode. Full name: Clyde Jackson Brown. He's an American singer songwriter who sold over 18 million uh, albums in the U.S. But actually, I mean, kind of more known for the songs that he wrote that were performed by other people. Most notably, songs like These Days by The Pretenders. He also wrote Take It Easy by The Eagles. Mm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> was that a noise? Or was that a... <laughs> I just, that was totally unexpected. <laughs> Wait a minute, he wrote a song for The Pretenders and then a faux country song for The Eagles. Wait a minute here. A faux yes. country. <laughs> Deal with it. <laughs> no. The Eagles don't are you talk about the Eagles. Band. No. I love the you, Eagles. But... Don't you even bring it up. <laughs> For the record, <laughs> um, Glenn Fry is not the best Eagle also. Uh, yeah. Okay. We already know that already. <laughs> as long as we're on the same page for that, I can forgive you. No. I, I am... Uh, and- I think we'll bring this up on a future music episode, but I'm just curious who you think that favorite eagle is. Uh, Don, Don Henley. Henley. <laughs> Don't you even try to tell me some other guy. No, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of impartial to Joe Walsh, but okay. <laughs> Joe Walsh. <laughs> I got I three words for you, going. John. I got three words for you. Boys of Summer. New York Minute. Come on now. <laughs> Dirty laundry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Back to Jackson Brown. All right. <laughs> he was born in Heiberg, Germany, where his father was stationed as a U.S. serviceman who was assigned the Stars and Stripes. He moved to L.A. when he was three years old and after graduating high school in 66, joined the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. <laughs> if you do not know the Nitty, the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, now they had a revolving door as far as members were concerned. They are most notably for most known for the song Fishing, uh, Fishing in the Dark, which is a fantastic country, like classic country hit. They did, they cover, it, it's technically, it's a cover of Mr. Bojangles because the original Mr. Bojangles was written back in the, I want to say, 40s. The version of Mr. Bojangles that everyone knows. He actually didn't last with them very long, even though they would eventually record his songs, the songs that he wrote these days, Holding, and Shadow Dream Song. He would actually leave the band just a few months after joining them and become a staff writer for Electro Record. After moving to New York's Greenwich Village. So in 67 and 68, he did backing vocals for the Velvet Underground. At the time, Brown was linked romantically with Velvet Underground singer Nico. He was actually a significant contributor on Nico's first solo album. He would then move back to LA where he would first meet Glenn Fry and write the song Take It Easy. So Brown's first songs were all recorded by other artists for the most part. By the Eagle, by Craig Allman, Linda Ronstadt. He really actually wouldn't release his own versions of those songs until 
years and years later. In 72, he would release his first solo record, a uh, self-titled de- uh, debut, which featured songs Doctor My Eyes, entered the top 10 in U.S. charts. 73 and 74, he released two more albums, 73's For Every Man, which included his own version of Take It Easy, and 74's Late for the Sky, which number one track featured was featured in Martin Scorsese's movie Taxi Driver. Mm. Uh, 1976 album, The Pretender, would feature Here Comes the Tears, which was actually about his wife, Phyllis Major. Phyllis Major was an actress and model, and a year after they got married, she would commit suicide. Uh, Almost a year to the day, the song Here Comes the Tears Again would reach number 23 on Hot 100 Billboard charts. I'm going to make a total admission that the only thing i knew about jackson brown before this episode was that he appeared in an episode of the simpsons <laughs> <laughs> and you know what um, i was just getting to that because he would continue <laughs> releasing solo music through the 80s including the song somebody's baby which was featured in fast times at ridgemont high that's the only 82. reason why i know him so <laughs> that's the only reason why and we hit him. number seven on the Hot 100, and then in the 90s, he would get all political in his music, and in the 2003 episode, uh, The Simpsons called Break My Wife, Please, he would perform a parody song called Rosie. Yep. Then, uh, continuing, he would continue to be very political and very much part of the Democratic Party, so much that in 2008, he sued John McCain for using Running on Empty, one of his songs, in an Obama Obama attack ad. He would win. Uh, Good for him. So Screw actually, him. I, and so there's your music. Well, this was, I guess it wasn't, I first I was thinking it was more of an eclectic mix, but actually now that I think about it, a lot of these are singer-songwriters who do like folksy kind of music in a lot of cases. So good on Miami Vice picking out music that kind of fits yeah. with the episode too, where they have a song about central American politics. So yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and I was thoroughly enjoyed by the Stephen Jones, Andy Taylor, David Bowie connection. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, that just tickled me. <laughs> Let's go talk about our final thoughts on this episode. All right, guys, I'll kick off this week because I think I have an an unpopular opinion here. I stand by my earlier statement, which is this episode really is it's a Sonny Crockett standalone story. It doesn't really involve the Miami Vice. Dad never really gets involved. We don't see anyone else except for Switek make a mistake and Trudy read some stuff off the wire. So this really was a sunny only episode. And not saying that's a bad thing. I really did enjoy this episode. I liked it. It was really good. There was a lot of tension. The storyline was it made more sense normally than what than like the last episode with Maynard. So I really did enjoy this episode. But it's not a Miami Vice story. This is uh the Sunny Crockett TV show. That's what this episode was from. So, and I have a feeling there's going to be more of those coming up in the future. Melissa, what are your final thoughts as you give me daggers? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you said like, it's not a bad thing, but you acted like it was a bad thing. (laughs) Let's get real here, people. People are tuning in for Don Johnson. They want Don Johnson centric (laughs) storylines. They want Sonny. That's what they want. <laughs> no, I I mean, I like this episode. It's not definitely not. I'm not saying it's like in my top 10 of episodes. I like it. I don't like the Irish Stone. I never did. I'm not. That's not my. I don't like the conspiracy part of it. I, that's the part of it I don't like. Because mm-hmm. I feel like when you get this conspiracy theory like episodes, they never you never get the um the result that you want. Like you want him to be caught. You want him to be caught for what he's doing and exposed Maynard should be exposed and for people to know like the, the atrocity he's committing because for money, basically. But you don't get that satisfaction of him getting caught. All you get is poor Irish Stone. Really, he's not a bad guy. He, I mean, he's confused and he wants money. But <laughs> he was literally trying to, you know, out mm-hmm. what was going on. And he gets killed instead. Which, so, I mean, so part of me is like, I'm kind of happy that I don't have to worry about that storyline coming. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good episode. It finished out. It, it definitely was a Crockett episode. And I think that you hit it earlier when we talked about earlier, me and you, that they were trying to finish it out. They were, it was a Michael Mann story. And they were like, we've got to close this out before we move on to anything else. Let's just not go back to that anymore. <laughs> yeah. And they closed it out. And now they can go on. But if you don't like episodes uh, where there's uh, it, it doesn't. But, it, did they, but Maynard got away. How did they close it out if he can still come <laughs> back and cause? Because they don't go back to it. That's how they close it out. <laughs> He's 
leading some militia yeah, he's in gone. South America. And now, there's no so. like they have no evidence to bring him back in, right? There's no like, hey, we still have this smoking so gun their, on you. But that's their idea of closing it out. The bad guy gets away and just Yeah, because they're never gonna bring him back. Back to yeah. Miami. Yep, that's it. He just didn't well he might come back to Miami. We just don't know it. <laughs> what I was saying well, is that, that, that kind of changes my final thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that story doesn't come back. That's it. Or well, at least G. Gordon Liddy part of it doesn't come back. Maybe they bring it back in another episode, but not that part. Anyways, what I was saying is like if you don't like the whole like we're gonna go off and do stuff that's not necessarily vice, <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> good luck. <laughs> It's going to be a long season. <laughs> John, what are your final thoughts? He's rewriting so, them. <laughs> uh, well, so my final thoughts was G. Gordon Liddy seems to be Crockett's Moriarty. As he always seems to get away. He always seems to get one past him. My first thought was of all of the episodes that they didn't finish, you know, that could that they wanted to go back and tie up the storyline for. Like, why this one? Why not the Frank Zappa pirate episode. I'm going to still harp on that. Oh, get Never over get it already. <laughs> Move on. Why not the tub baby episode? <laughs> yeah, okay. I agree um, on that one. No. There, there's a lot of episodes we don't get closure on, but they, we, we're, you know, we're going to go back and do the second half of this, the Ira Stone Maynard one. And then, like <laughs> I said, Maynard seems to be the perfect bad guy for Vice because he seems to always outsmart them or at least get away. So I don't see how this is even closing it up because Maynard still gets away. He could still cause more problems in the in the future. So I'm just, I, I mean, apparently he doesn't by your tone. I was just curious because I thought like, well, maybe we'll see that fantastic mustache again. <laughs> It'll come it riding through. Again. <laughs> And for the record, I think that they chose to close this story, whatever. They chose to bring this story back because it was a rip from the headlines. Mm -hmm. So they could no, make... And a, I, and they I, could I make, get that. Yeah, and they could make a political point, I get right? that. It's a, it's a rip from the headlines. It's a pretty good episode. I agree with Dominic. Like, this doesn't feel like very much police, or very much all about vices. It's just kind of all about Crockett. Like, I mean, it could have been... I don't know. I guess it could have been a Nash Bridges episode, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I don't yeah, know. No I was just kind of thinking. I, I was just. I don't watch that that one. <laughs> I was just thinking, like maybe G. Gordon Liddy's gonna come back. Maybe he's gonna create more havoc. So, but I don't know. <laughs> um, it is nice to finally be done with Ira. I guess. Uh, hopefully, we get a little more, a little more of a team effort next week. I guess. <laughs> well. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We are just beginning season three, and we have a lot of thoughts on what's happening so far just in this very beginning under the new leadership and the new writing and the new direction of the show. So we hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to check out the website, GoWithTheHeat.com. If you're interested in catching this on YouTube, you can find our YouTube channel. Just go look for Go With The Heat podcast on YouTube. You'll be able to find all of these on there so if you're in a scenario where you'd rather do it through youtube or you would like to be able to watch it say on some networks on some internet connections that only let you have access to youtube you'll be able to catch the show there I remind you that if you're enjoying this if you're enjoying this episode or this show we encourage you to give us a review on your platform of choice and you know what i'm not going to be shy about it i'm going to ask for a thumbs up or a five stars or whatever the top rating is on that platform of choice it helps people find the show and helps them find the majestic beauty <laughs> that is Miami Vice. We would also love, love, love to hear from emails. Go with the heat at gmail.com. We'd like to know what your thoughts are that this story never makes an official ending or with Maynard. Maynard never comes to an official ending. What are your thoughts on that? Emails. Go with the heat at gmail.com. You send us an email. We'd be happy to answer those emails right here on the show. We would love to hear your thoughts. Or if you have questions, we'd be happy to read them right here on the show. So that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Just to let you know we will be off next week don't want to say be off we're gonna have a little short episode for you we're gonna be on the road two of the three of us are gonna be on the road so we're not gonna be able to record a normal episode so next week you're gonna get a little little short episode of us talking a little bit about what's happening in my advice right now we will be back to a full regular episode the week after so just keep an eye out for the short we've got a little treat for you in that week that we're gonna be off that's gonna do it for us this week and we'll catch y'all next time bye pal